Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I choose to start my contribution with a quote. I pray you and your families will never have to endure a situation similar to ours. But in reality, unless you do, you'll never have enough understanding or empathy to help legalise voluntary assisted dying in Tasmania. Sit with me during the last few days of my life, look me in the eyes, deny me of ending my suffering while my withered away body convulses in pain. There is nothing humane about this ending. This is not my life or my body anymore. I am a shell and you've taken control of me. Let us live the last chapter of our lives fearlessly, knowing we can end our own suffering and despair. There is a difference between suicide and VAD. I do not want to die, I am dying. Madam Speaker, that's a quote uh, from uh, the last paragraphs of the last entry of Diane Gray as she passed. And I start with this statement because this was the moment. I heard this message read out on ABC Morning Radio one morning when I was driving, uh, where Diane's daughters, Jackie and Nat, talked about the tragic and painful end to their mother's life. It was the moment that, in my mind, started this latest attempt to pass voluntary assisted dying end of life choices laws into Tasmania. I can recall sitting in my car listening to this interview with tears streaming down my cheeks. Moved by the heartbreak of it and knowing that as a parliamentarian we had the collective power to ensure that it did not have to be that way. It did not have to be so painful that it could and it should be different. I have voted in this place once before in favour of voluntary assisted dying and I'll make the clear indication to you all today that I will again. Although this time is altogether different. The powerful image of Diane Gray and her loving daughters embracing each other on Jackie's wedding day has become the heart-filled, emblematic image and motivation for change. It's a motivation for change that has swept Tasmania and moved thousands to not only tell their story and demand their voice be heard, but also for the many to argue for change. I've had the pleasure of meeting with Jack and Nat, and they are a force of nature, and playing a small role, and I thank them for giving me all the hilly areas to do some letterboxing, um, playing a small role in their campaign, a campaign born from a promise to their mum, a promise to do all they could to ensure that no other family need experience the hurt and pain that they and their mother had to endure. A pain that so many families across Tasmania bear and we all ultimately fear. Their commitment to their mum's memory is as inspirational as it is courageous, Madam Speaker. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge the work performed by the member for Mersey, Mike Gaffney, on this and his extensive and comprehensive public consultation on the bill and the calm and thoughtful manner in which he has engaged our community. I attended a number of community events uh, where he answered questions and he made the, made the, the choice to be and, and he was so dispassionate and he said, look, I'm just going to answer your question calmly. I don't, I'm not going to invoke emotion into it. I'm just going to answer you as best I can. Um, and it was such a, um, a, an, a, not only appropriate, but it was such a powerful way to deal with people's questions around this most important of matter. And his work and the way he's engaged in, in our community has made this change possible. And I'd also like to, at this stage, acknowledge the work of our Upper House members in their thoughtful and considerate approach to the legislation, their debate and their respectful debate around amendments uh, and, and the production of the piece of legislation that's before us today. Because the legislation we debate today is comprehensive. It is well thought through. It provides a balanced and responsible approach to managing and dealing with the most sensitive and complex of issues. It provides the safeguards necessary to ensure that a safe, secure and informed environment for choices are to be provided to those people that are suffering from a terminal illness and for those who are hurting with them. The choice is provided with the medical advice and supervision and in a defined and limited range of circumstances. We are, we are not the only jurisdiction to respond to these circumstances and tackle these difficult matters. It's been resolved and is being managed in Victoria and WA. It's being resolved and being managed in jurisdictions across the world. 
it is a consensus building and pragmatic approach to this most difficult of issues. It is born out of the acknowledgement that whilst we have some of the most and most amazing and best medical practitioners and health professionals in the world who do amazing work supporting people who are ill in receiving the best of treatments, it acknowledges we do not have all the answers. Medical practitioners and health professionals play a role in the first and last moments of our lives, the cradle to grave, so to speak. As my colleague, Dr Bastian Seidel, the member for Hewan, has said in the debate in the other house, and I paraphrase, we must realise that we do not have all the answers or the treatments, and there are moments where the medical profession, despite their best efforts, are unable to meet the needs of all patients. They are unable to stop all pain and to give all people a peaceful death. And in, in saying this moment here, I'd like to acknowledge the work of our palliative care specialists um, around Tasmania who do amazing work in supporting people in their last days of their lives. We must realise, though, that prolonging death is not extending life. We are not talking about a matter of life and death. We are debating about the kind of death we wish to have. I know and acknowledge there are strong views against this bill, and whilst I will not repeat them in this contribution as they are well known, I can say that I have listened and reflected on them. It has ensured I have approached this vote and my position on this bill with the full knowledge of the opposing views. It has made my normal process of consideration on matters of policy even more comprehensive, and I thank them. On the whole, the opposing arguments to this bill have been made in a respectful and earnest way, and I thank those people that have contacted me for doing so. Many arguments were made from a faith-based position or a philosophical perspective. I respect these arguments. I understand them. I simply disagree on this matter and on this issue. This bill and this debate is about balancing the importance of life and the manner of one's death equally. Providing choices for people within a clear, safe and secure framework to manage their passing in according with their choice, but also respecting their human dignity. These are the things at the heart of this bill. I would quote an email I received from Mike Gibson from Port, uh, Port Sorrell. He says, the most important aspect I would like to support is the individual's choice. My belief is that most people will not use this measure, but with it in place, it gives them a freedom of choice, along with other measures such as palliative care and under end of other end of life choices. We should be able to offer people a choice in a responsible manner and respect their wishes. As a retired paramedic, I have seen too often great suffering of patients with little to no choice about their own end of life. I've also seen too much trauma to families from people committing suicide and to some who fail only to end up in a worse state. We as a society surely have the right to inform decisions and choices for ourselves. With, vig with rigorous safeguards and with checks and balances in place, this bill represents a safe option for those who choose to enact it. That does not mean it must be enacted or in essence forced on someone without their express wish. In fact, most people at the end of life will not have the capacity to make this choice. But for those who can, it could provide an effective peace of mind option. To every person that has contacted me, regardless of your viewpoint, I say thank you. I, and I say to you today, I read your letters, I read your emails, your social media posts, I heard your stories, I heard your views, and I respect your opinions. For those that share deeply personal and painful experiences, I would like to thank you. It is an enormous responsibility to receive your stories, to cherish and honour them, and to respond and give purpose to the act of sharing, and in that act, the implicit task you have asked me to perform. It was not wasted. I see you, I hear you, and I'm committed to act. It's hard to put into words the emotion and the moments you have shared with me. I can say that it's had a profound impact on me. The courage you have shown... Oh, Burns are pretty passionate people, <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> I don't apologise for that. The pain and suffering you and your loved ones have experienced will not be in vain. 
so many stories, Madam Speaker, so many stories, and many members have come up and, and shared some of them, all of them important, all of them valid. And this parliament has heard their voice, Madam Speaker, loud and clear. Remember um, reading Wayne Crawford's piece, and, and before I became um, a politician and joined um, this place, I would, I would occasionally spend time and have lunch with Wayne and his beautiful wife, Margaret, would, um, would drop him at the restaurant and we'd, we'd dissect the world of politics. And, and when he contributed on this matter, it was so powerful. And he wrote about the final months of the life that he, uh, of months of life he shared with his beautiful wife, Margaret, and how he talked about their Romeo and Juliet like pact to go together, rather than being allowed the option of a peaceful, civilised death by going to sleep with family present to give comfort and wish bon voyage on the final, inevitable stage of a life well lived and now well left. I heard the story of Louise Elliott, a young mum who simply wanted to know her children, wanted her children to know that she died in peace. And Cara Rickard, who's an absolute champion woman, vibrant, she'd been diagnosed with a terminal illness, metastatic breast cancer. I had the absolute pleasure, and it was an absolute pleasure, of meeting her and spending some time chatting to her and her partner about her life, her love and her passions. In her own words, Cara is a 35-year-old living in Rose Bay, Tasmania, a, psycholog a psychologist who loves painting, bushwalking and photography. She has rainbow-coloured hair, and her friends have described her as the most alive person they have ever met. Cara volunteers as a mentor to psychology students. She loves working with vulnerable members of our community, and much of her career has been in the youth mental health space. She smiles and laughs a lot, and she makes friends easily. I can see why. She's from a large family, and she lives with a loving husband and their, and their beautiful dog. She's not the kind of person you immediately think of when voluntary sister dying is, raising, is raised. Again, in her words, I try to maintain compassion for people who are scared and whose fear drives them to try to dictate my choices, because she just believes that most people who are against voluntary assisted dying are scared that by allowing a choice, they're saying they condone people dying, which is not the case at all. Cara can understand her, those fears whilst also believing they are not sufficient reason to take her choices away. Voluntary assisted dying, end of life choices, is very much about valuing human life. And you don't value people's lives by refusing to listen to people or by ignoring their wishes. And in her words, my wish, as cancer steals my life away and I leave this beautiful world is for no one to steal my death. I have accepted that cancer will ultimately claim my wife, my life. I do not think the Tasmanian government should have the right to claim my death. These are heartfelt words of someone who is most impacted by this legislation and I pay respects to her and her contribution to this campaign. In decisions like this, Madam Speaker, I do tend to reach out um, to those who've inspired my political journey and my own social justice activism. And in this case, it's Nobel Peace Prize winning human rights activist and Anglican priest, Bishop Desmond Tutu. And I'll quote, with my life closer to its end than its beginning, I wish to give people, wish to help to give people dignity in dying. Just as I, just as I have argued firmly for compassion and fairness in life, I believe that terminally ill people should be treated with the same compassion and fairness when it comes to their deaths. Dying people should have the right to choose how and when they leave Mother Earth. I believe that alongside the wonderful palliative care that exists, their choices should include a dignified assisted death. For those suffering unbearably and coming to the end of their lives, merely knowing that an assisted death is open to them can provide immeasurable comfort. He concluded, in refusing dying people the right to die with dignity, we fail to demonstrate the compassion that lies at the heart of Christian values. I pray that politicians, lawmakers, and religious leaders have the courage to support the choices terminally ill citizens make in departing Mother Earth. The time to act is now. I'll quote uh, Mercury Journal Wayne Crawford again in his, in his article. The Tasmanian legislators should, in considering Mike Gaffney's attempt to give our community the right to manage the manner and timing of our own death, finally accede to the overwhelming wishes of the community and allow individual choice on this most personal of decisions. To do otherwise will be to yield to interests which would rather 
that in desperation we take the risk of using untested, unregulated and risky methods of ending life. Much the same as we are forced to rely on the unregulated drug trade when desperately seeking pain relief. Madam Speaker, as we all know, we've had debates on voluntary assisted dying many times before over many years. In my time here, three, pre in my time um, in the sand, three previous attempts have been made to achieve voluntary assisted dying legislation in this place. And I pay tribute to those that have advocated so strongly, to those that have maintained their dignified persistence to provide the ultimate dignity to those that choose it, to those that deserve it. I paid my respects to Mike Gaffney for his work, but I also want to pay my respects to Margaret Singh from Dying With Dignity, who has been relentless and it has been a powerful force in driving change and driving this debate, keeping it on the public, in the public eye and maintaining her commitment to seeing this thing through. Now, I'm sure Margaret will always, in her, in her own way, will say we can do better than this, and she's probably right, but by goodness me, we've made a step today. And hopefully if this legislation passes this house, an enormous step for people across Tasmania. In my view, we've reached what I is called the 38 degree moment. You see, it's the tipping point. 38 degrees is the critical angle at which snowflakes come together to form an avalanche, the breaking of a wave, so to speak. And I believe we've reached the 38 degree moment in this debate, Madam Speaker. The work of Jack and Nat Gray and the beautiful little Tilly, um, building upon many years of good people striving for change has brought <coughs> us to this point, the tipping point. The momentum for change around voluntary assisted dying, end of life choices, has built into an avalanche of hope and compassion. Change is happening and hopefully this house can respond to the thousands seeking, hoping and demanding this change. To end a loved one's suffering, to empower them to make a choice, to assist them to pass without the needless pain is a gift, Madam Speaker. I support voluntary assisted dying, end of life choices legislation, and I commend the House to the bill. The bill to the House. Thank you, the Honourable <laughs> Madeleine Ogilvie.